Well, I'm going to get started. My name is Denise Vera. I am um, one of the nurse educators and the nurse informatics coordinator for the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. And I wanted to welcome everyone to this official launch of the fourth edition of the Johns Hopkins Evidence-Based Practice for Nurses and Healthcare Professionals book. The Johns Hopkins model and tools have been used extensively by healthcare clinicians for over a decade now and have proven to be one of the most foundational books on EVP in nursing and healthcare. Today, we're joined by most of the authors. Unfortunately, we couldn't have them all here, but most of them are here um, that were involved with the fourth edition. And I'm very excited to have this opportunity to learn more about the book directly from the contributing authors. Um, we do encourage questions. If you have questions throughout the webinar, um, feel free to throw them in the chat box. We do have someone monitoring the questions. If it's a specific chapter, you might want to let us know what chapter you're referencing so we can direct the question to that appropriate author who might be able to answer it the best. And we're going to um, answer all of the questions at the end of the session. You will also, after this launch party, you will be receiving an email. And it's a very special email. It's loaded with a lot of good stuff. First, we're going to include the links to the updated 2022 EVP tools. We will also include a link to the STTI website where if you're interested in purchasing the fourth edition book, you're able to. We created a very brief, uh, it's about 18 minute long video that discusses what's different with the 2022 model and tools compared to the previous version. And it's just a really great reference if you just kind of want that, um, the cliff note version of tell me what's new. Um, and uh, that will be included in that email. And also, those of you that have attended our AVP workshops and uh, boot camps know that I am all about fun and prizes. So we are giving away um, a free copy of the fourth edition of the book to one of our lucky participants that's uh, joining us today. So make sure you check your email and your, um, your spam folders for all of that information. All right, I think we have everybody here that's joining us. We're up to 46 people, so welcome everyone. So I think we should just get underway and start at the beginning with chapter one. So chapter one is the uh, EVP context, concerns and challenges. And the author of chapter one was Kim Bissett. She's also authored chapter four, 10 and 11. Um, Kim is a nurse educator and the director of the Center for Evidence-Based Practice at the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. She assisted with the development and publication of the second and third edition of the book and model previously. So welcome, Kim. Thank you. And, How are you um, doing? I'm doing good. So chapter one. So I guess, like I've been saying, give us like a cliff note version or what are the takeaways that you really can share with us about chapter one? Chapter one is a pretty short chapter, really just an introduction to evidence-based practice, giving a little bit of the history. But before we really dive into that, I just wanted to kind of address the change in our title. So previously, we were the Johns Hopkins uh, Nursing Evidence-Based Practice Model and Guidelines book. And so we've, we've moved away from the nursing aspect, and we're looking at it as for nurses and healthcare professionals. We've always known um, as the authors and as those really immersed in the model that the model is for anyone, that it's not just for nurses, any healthcare care professional can use it. But we got a lot of feedback from users in other disciplines that they didn't feel it was appropriate for them because it, would, it included the word nurses. So that chapter one introduces that concept and talks about how EBP is for healthcare professionals and how it can be used by anyone. So we're starting a campaign this year with the publication of this book to let everybody know that the model is not just for nurses, that it's applicable or it's appropriate for all um, healthcare professionals. We have, a, we have a video, Denise, do you have access I to do, that? I do, I'm ready and I'm excited to okay. play it. This is an, our inaugural video for this new campaign that we're launching. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Okay, so you are the first to see this video. So here we go. Your patients rely on you to provide the most up-to-date scientifically sound care. How can you be sure you're providing it? The Johns Hopkins evidence-based practice model is used by healthcare organizations, colleges, and universities all over the world. In fact, it's one of the most foundational books on EBP in healthcare. But did you know it's not just for nurses? That's right. This innovative model can help all clinical professionals better serve their patients 
and our new updated model incorporates content based on feedback from past users and refinement in real life settings, resulting in an even more robust tool. More than a textbook, the model includes expanded evidence-based practice tools that walk you through the entire process, ultimately helping you improve patient care. So what are you waiting for? Use a proven method for providing exceptional patient care while strengthening your knowledge, all with the Johns Hopkins Evidence-Based Practice Model. So, I think it's pretty cool. Yes, we're very excited to share it. Um, with this group. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So I think that just the chap chapter one in brief is about EBP. Why do we need it? Why is there a push for evidence-based practice? How can it help us? And really just providing a foundation before we dive into EBP more in depth. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so moving on to chapter two, which is on creating a supportive EBP environment. Unfortunately, the authors of chapter two couldn't join us today, but this is a discussion that everyone here can, um, can contribute to. So we know that creating that environment that supports EBP is essential to a success. And the good thing about the panel today is there's many different perspectives of, of this, this angle. So many of you are faculty that teach the model to students. Many are nurses that lead the bedside clinicians in the health system. So I wanted to just open up this discussion to the entire panel as a whole. If you could um, just share your thoughts or your pearls of wisdom of what's a way that you can create that environment that supports EBP. I'll be happy to start. Oh, oh great, great. That's good. great, Robin. Yep. And I, I have to say that that's really the cornerstone of evidence-based practice. As excited as we get about the evidence-based practice methods, when we think about integrating it into a clinical setting or into a health system, there's a lot that needs to be considered beyond the synthesis and the recommendations for evidence. And what I would say is the major components are human and material resources and leadership support. So the leader has to support evidence-based practice and the package that's going to help to accelerate evidence-based practice within the practice setting. So that's number one. And that's not just the chief nurse executive, but it's the other leaders in the organizations because many questions that we ask as nurses are not significant to nursing that may be significant to other fields as well, uh, as, as well as significant to nursing. And then there are these human uh, aspects. And those human aspects are the competences, competencies we have to synthesize the evidence, to ask that good question, to evaluate the evidence and make the practice a recommendation. So those are all special skills. And uh, even if you're in a course now, you are having an academic exercise, but the real thing is in the clinical arena when you make recommendations that are going to be uh, put into practice right away. So there has to be a process by which those recommendations are made. So it could be a research and evidence-based practice committee that's related to the policy committee so that the policies follow and a quality improvement that maybe is the action arm about how to get it into practice. All of those competencies associated with each one of those areas have to be present as well as the process. And then you have to have the material resources. Material resources can include things like um, making sure that you have maybe a library support person that can help you determine uh, the right keywords for a sensitive strategy. So you're getting all the right articles that you possibly can. Um, so those material resources will be things like uh, your committee structure and the materials that you have to do the work. Uh, may also be the human resource so that you have some support. So some that are new at evidence-based practice are a little, um, uh, a, a little concerned about doing it alone the first time. So you'll want some experts that uh, can mentor and, and uh, be available to you as you go through the process, at least the first couple times. And then the tools. So I, I, I'll stop there because there's oh. plenty to say. 
Yeah, I was going to say, um, I think one of the one of the most important things um, that although everything Robin mentioned is certainly important, um, is that development of mentors and having mentors that can actually work on, on with, you know, um, on the nursing units directly with the staff and give them that support and guidance um, to do the process. The other thing I really like about the chapter is it, it lays out a, a three year plan. Um, which I think you could, could definitely adapt, but it has it lays out the plan for how to get started and has lots of um, very down to earth ideas about how to do this within your organization. And then once you get there, how to sustain it. Okay, great. Anyone else like to share? Maddie, you have the you have a different angle as far as um, leading EBP at the in the health system. And actually that ties in, I know I said I was gonna answer questions at the end, but how do you involve those bedside nurses? How do you support them um, or bedside clinicians in general um, with their evidence-based practice uh, journey? Um, I think that's like the million dollar question. And I think if I had a perfect answer, <laughs> we, we, we wouldn't actually all be here. Um, but I do, did want to share that we have had an evidence-based practice cohort, which was a group of people who were mentored very specifically to do an EVP project. And so we really had them learn the process while completing a project. So it was really um, dovetailed nicely. And at the end, they had some recommendations for our CNO so that they were actually able to see the value in the work that they had done from the leadership level all the way down to the nurses who had done it. And having that really coached approach, let I, some of the feedback we had at the end was that people really felt like it was a much more accessible process. Um, they felt like those tools weren't just something that were written in a book, but rather something that were really tools for them to use, which they are intended for, but maybe that message isn't conveyed um, as sometimes it comes off as more academic when it's in a textbook versus a tool that nurses are supposed to use in their daily practice. And so we were really happy to be able to share that experience with everyone. Great, great, all right, thank you. That's good. good. Good advice. And if you have more questions, just keep, keep them coming to the chat box and we will address them. But let's move on to chapter three, which is Sandra Deerholtz chapter. Um, it is an overview of the entire process, process. So Sandy is an assistant director of nursing for the departments of neurosciences and psychiatry nursing at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. She's written numerous articles on EBP and has extensive experience in the development and delivery of um, EBP educational programs. And she actually was also one of the co-authors of the first edition of the book. So what can you tell us that is new and exciting about the overview of the entire process or model, Sandy? Well, first of all, hi everybody and welcome. Um, I always look at chapter three as kind of being the quick start guide. Um, because uh, it really does provide an overview of the process. And then the chapters in the book, as many of you know that follow, are in much more detail than what we have in chapter three. Um, some of the things that are new in chapter three, um, number one, as Kim already uh, talked about, is really uh, much more emphasis on um, interprofessional collaboration. Um, and I can say that, you know, even though the, our, this model from the start, was designed to be intercollaborative. I think the fourth edition, this edition, really, really highlights that interprofessional approach. The other aspect that we are highlighting is that um, EVP is certainly a very um, important element, but it's also now a core competency, not just for nursing, but for all disciplines. So this chapter talks about that. Um, we have, um, redesigned our model. And I think we, do we have a picture, a diagram oh. of the new model? Yes, we, we do. Can? I will be happy okay. to share it. Um, each year based on feedback that we get um, from individuals and, and things that we learn from um, teaching EBP, our ongoing experience, we really look at our model and we design it. And this year, uh, this edition, we've made a, a few tweaks in it. Uh, the biggest one is to really look at evidence-based practice in the context of the working within an interprofessional team. And then the second thing that we did is we felt that it was really important to add the concept of reflection to our model. And we did that because um, we know the importance of reflection in the, the learning process and that through reflection, teams can really solidify their learning and it it just enables teams to be able to 
um, really take in com uh, complex knowledge and ideas. So we really felt that reflection was a key part of our model. So those were the changes that we made in terms of the actual depiction of the model. Um, uh, other additions that we've made to the model, um, we've included more information on critical thinking and clinical reasoning and how that plays a role in evidence-based practice. Um, and then uh, uh, one question that we get from time to time is, um, particularly from students, I think, is really what the foundation for our model was. And when we took time to reflect uh, as a team what that was, we really realized that our basis was really in inquiry learning, the inquiry, inquiry learning process, um, because we really felt that um, you know, learning can, and knowledge can best be acquired through hands-on experience and also through self-directed groups. So we really kind of looked at some of the earlier, earlier theorists in terms of teaching learning processes, such as Dewey and Piaget, um, as a foundation for our model and for our process. So we, we've added um, content on, on that. Um, and then lastly, um, the steps of the EVP process. Um, we actually have added two more steps, but I don't want people to guess because we, we had 18 steps to start, we now have 20. Um, but truly we, we added that to clarify ex, um, steps just to make them clearer for individuals. So it's, it's more steps, but the reason why we did it was for that clarity. And we've done some slight um, reorganizing of the steps. I think they're very slight. Uh, but again, we wanted to reflect what we were seeing in practice and people telling us, you know, how they really implemented these steps. So um, those are the key points that I, I wanted to uh, mention in terms of uh, chapter three. That's great. Thank you. And again, if you are joined us late, we're going to be sending a follow up email and in the email um, is going to be a very brief video clip that Kim and I put together discussing what's new on each individual appendix. So um, we walk you through the entire process so it just makes it a little bit easier to understand. Okay, so let's move on to chapter four. So chapter four is Judy, Judy Asenzi. She uh, was involved in chapter four and chapter nine. And Judy is the director of the pediatric nursing programs for education, informatics and research at the Johns Hopkins Children's Center. She teaches part-time at the School of Nursing and has presented and consulted nationally on the topic of EVP. So chapter four addresses the first phase of the PET process, which is your practice question phase. So take it away, Judy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your chapter? Sure. So chapter four, as um, Denise said, really has always uh, talked about the practice question. And um, we still talk about the practice question in that chapter um, pretty significantly, but we also have identified and made some changes and um, really talked about the importance of bringing in an interprofessional EBP team to help uh, ensure that we are doing the right practice question. Um, you know, we found over the years that if you don't get your practice question right, your EBP will not be answered. Your EBP project may be going down a path that you didn't intend it to go down. And essentially, um, it could all, your project could not answer what your true problem is. And so we really kind of identified the importance of bringing in more examples of your interdisciplinary or interprofessional team and getting that team um, kind of developed uh, before you even start down the PEP process. Um, and so we really kind of um, emphasize that at the beginning of the chapter, we provide some examples of different interprofessional teams um, and how they've helped in the EVP process, um, most definitely around the idea of um, defining the problem. Um, which, um, as I, I can't stress this enough, I, I stress this with all my DNP or my doctorate of nursing practice students, that uh, we've got to get that practice question right. And so again, we reiterate that in this chapter, we talk about the differences between background and foreground questions, which is, again, is something that uh, is near and dear to my heart with my doctoral students, um, as well as my uh, bedside nurses in my department. Um, I often try to remind them that background questions really allow us to truly um, 
truly do what the evidence tells us to do. Where foreground questions, I, I love foreground question, but I don't like to do a foreground question um, until we've done an exhaustive background question because I almost feel like a foreground question might steer you down a path of not really doing what the evidence tells you to do and really do what you want to do. Um, and so I really, that's like my mantra that I, I tell to all of the folks uh, that I uh, help mentor with projects. Um, the other really um, uh, new section, or I guess uh, we've talked about it before, but we've really kind of, uh, to really elaborate it, um, is on page 92 of our chapter. We um, have a chart that actually is part of Appendix A um, in one of the tools where we really try to talk about a decision tree to determine if you actually need to do an EVP project. And as Robin uh, had stated earlier and Kim and others, really um, sometimes EVP projects, it's not necessary to do an EVP project because there's no evidence, um, et cetera, or maybe the evidence is so robust that um, there's a systematic review that has already identified this, that we can go right into a translation part of a QI project, or do we need to go into a research project? So we're really hoping that um, the addition of this uh, in more detail in chapter four will help guide teams to be very effective in um, going down which decision tree um, that you should uh, go down, whether you need to do a full-blown EVP, et cetera. Um, and so that section um, I would draw your attention to, as well as, uh, like I said, in Appendix A, which you will be getting in that video. The next um, section that we kind of differentiated in that chapter is also around the idea of the differentiating between quality improvement evidence-based practice and research. And we know uh, from our bedside nurses um, that this can um, oftentimes be a confusing um, thing for them to figure out. And so we try to elaborate and make it as clear as we can be. And I would think that this would have applicability in other interprofessional uh, team members, uh, helping them to clarify the direction that the team is trying to go. So we definitely added that in there. And then at the very end, we introduced the um, importance of identifying stakeholders. And you might say, well, what's the difference between a stakeholder and your interdisciplinary or interprofessional EVP team? I often think that they can be one and of the same. However, stakeholders, I always feel is like a different le level, that they're people that you need to inform and include, et cetera, but they might not be um, in the heat of, or in the rolled up their sleeves actually doing the EVP project. And so we tried to make that as clear as we could for folks going down this EVP journey, not to forget about the stakeholders that you need to get in um, for buy-in uh, to provide you with resources. Um, some of the things that Robin alluded to, sometimes those stakeholders uh, we need to bring in sooner versus later to ensure that we are um, one in alignment with the goals and strategic priorities of your organization um, as well. So we introduce it at the end of that chapter. Um, and then, of course, with the practice question, Appendix B, um, you know, is kind of the bread and butter for that chapter, um, getting your, your practice question, your PICO question um, all uh, defined. And then, obviously, because we do introduce the ideas of stakeholders, Appendix C would be something that you would start to kind of tap into um, at the end of Chapter 4. So that's really the highlights of um, our Chapter 4. We tried to update our examples of uh, different types of problem um, that we would form in the in the um, format of a practice question. And so um, there have been definitely the the meat of that chapter is there. However, we have added a few additions that hope will make um, defining the practice question a little bit easier for teams. Great, that's great. Thank you. You're so welcome. We'll move on to chapter five, which is searching the evidence. And we have one of the authors that's here today, Maddie Whalen. Um, Maddie has a huge job because she is the EVP program coordinator for the entire Johns Hopkins Health System. She supports the frontline nursing and clinicians in completing their um, actionable EVP projects. So welcome, Maddie. So uh, chapter five, there was a lot of authors involved in this one, but, um, and 
searching the evidence can be such a challenge. So what, what can you add um, that you hope the readers would gain from this chapter? Um, well, actually, I think the thing that I would hope people take away is that um, the people who really wrote the majority of this chapter were the librarians. So although I'm the nurse and the EBP coordinator, the librarians um, were the people who really needed to be on this project to get this right. Um, so the librarians, they have a wealth of knowledge and were able to provide a lot of information really about the changing landscape of the literature. Um, we are so electronic now that we're really the way that PubMed has been updated, as well as Joanna Briggs Institute, they're sort of revamping their image. And so we were able to make those changes reflected in the book. Um, so people are just a little bit more aware of how things look when you go to those websites now, and I'm sure they'll be updated again shortly, and we'll have a great chapter five in the future. Um, and then the other thing we did was really put up some new examples and some more emphasis on the PICO question and how, again, like Judy mentioned, that's going to drive, if you don't have the right question, you're not going to have the right answer and how that really drives the search. And then finally, in the end, we did also add some guidance that I'm really excited about, about what to actually do once you get your search sent to you or you complete your search. You might um, end up with a thousand articles and then what do you do with that thousand articles to get it to really the 15 or the 20 that really answer your questions and how to do that in a way that um, the whole team is able to follow and you're able to report on in the end. Um, so those were sort of the big highlights of some of the changes we made. That's great. I love to hear that there's examples included because that was actually someone's question just now that popped up. So it's a good segue that, uh, that along the way there are examples of included because what it's supposed to look like. So I think that's very helpful. We might as well just keep going with you, Maddie, because chapter six, the evidence appraisal research is uh, your chapter also. Um, yeah, so I was one of the co-authors on the chapter with um, Debbie Dang. Um, sort of as a prelude to that, we actually were able to include sort of an introduction to the whole evidence section. So both the um, research evidence and the non-research evidence. And in that, we sort of talk about what is an evidence hierarchy in general for those people who are newer to the process, and then go a little bit more into detail about what it is to summarize and then what it means to synthesize once you're able to evaluate your evidence, because that's all part of that E process of the PET process. Um, that's something that from teaching, we've noticed that people tend to struggle a little bit with. And so that was something that we really thought was important to give a little bit more guidance on um, this idea of what's the difference between listing information versus um, gleaning higher meaning from that information and using that to be able to put into process um, a change in your environment. So that was sort of, that's sort of the, precursor to the chapter six. Um, we did a little bit of reorganization to hopefully make it a little easier to follow. Um, it's probably, I think, the longest chapter in the book, um, which we, we tried our best to make it as short and succinct as possible, but I still think it might be. Um, and so we just tried to add a lot more clarity. And again, we always wanted to emphasize that this book is written for the bedside nurse. And we want that information to be as digestible as possible. So including very concrete information, concrete examples about the different literature they might come across, as well as reflecting a lot of the changes that we're seeing in literature, especially in the nursing literature, um, as we're moving things like scoping reviews, integrative reviews are becoming more and more popular. And luckily more and more nurses and other healthcare professionals are publishing their work. And that means that we're seeing more things that maybe fall um, into the non-research evidence as a lot of it's really focused on clinical practice. And so we wanted to make sure that we were you know, updating the research portion of the book to reflect the way that the healthcare literature is moving in general. Great, great. And I, I love the new tools for those that haven't, that will be seeing the new tools shortly. Um, they're so much smooth. I think they're so much smoother with the flow charts and the diagrams that really help with the flow of things. It's much more succinct. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to move on to chapter seven, which is the evidence appraisal for non research evidence. And today we have Michelle Patch and Jennifer Peterson that are with us. They are both um, clinical nurse specialists and assistant professors at the School of Nursing. So how about your, um, your chapter on chapter seven? Can you share some of the main points um, about the appraisal of non-research evidence? Of course. Uh, thank you so much for having us today and welcome everyone. Um, so chapter seven, we dig a little bit more into the evidence appraisal specifically of non-research. And so when we say non-research, we're looking at the summaries of evidence, for instance, the clinical practice guidelines or position statements. Uh, then we look at expert opinions and case reports, uh, organizational experience, right? Like quality improvement projects, financial data, 
Um, and we also uh, dig a bit more into community standards, clinician experience, and consumer preference. Um, so we describe all of these types of research, and then we explain some strategies and how best to evaluate them, um, as well as recommending ways that you as clinicians uh, can improve the capacity, as well as leadership, um, of how to appraise this type of evidence and then be able to integrate that into your practice. Uh, Jenny, um, I'll say with you. So we have uh, expanded the definition or the, the discussion about different types of literature reviews because we're seeing more and more literature reviews that used to be either a systematic review or a generic review of literature to now include things like narrative reviews and scoping reviews and what are all of those things and how can they be best used? Um, we've talked a little bit more about program evaluation. We've talked about um, clinical practice guidelines and consensus statements that are increasingly being developed by different organizations and what are their, um, their, their biases and their, and their uh, benefits of using those. We've also talked more about um, double counting of studies in, uh, in literature reviews and kind of how to acknowledge that. Uh, we've also talked in this chapter now, a new discussion about best practice companies, things like um, the advisory uh, board or other types of, of companies that provide best practices um, with some caveats, um, but they can still be very, very useful. Great, that's great, thank you. Um, so chapter eight is on translation, and that brings us to Robin, who we've met earlier, but you didn't have your formal introduction. So Robin Newhouse is the Dean of the Indiana University School of Nursing and Indiana University Distinguished Professor. She co-authored the first edition of the book, and in 2019 was recognized as a Distinguished EBP Trailblazer by the Falls Association. So uh, I'm sorry, the National Institute. So translation, Robin, is a very challenging phase of the PET process. So um, this is a, it's, it's a good chapter. So what can you tell us about it um, that we can take away? Well, I just wanna start by saying one of the great things about the Johns Hopkins evidence-based practice model is it's practical. And it rings true with what we do as nurses when we interact with patients. Likewise, the translation chapter includes not only the background of uh, translation, uh, it defines implementation science. And um, I, I should just say that when we talk about implementation science, we're talking about the methods to get a clinical intervention into practice. When we're talking about translation, we're talking about the steps. There are a lot of different ways to translate. We're also talking about getting it into practice, but we're not studying the methods like implementation science does. So it's the chapter starts with some of those baseline uh, definitions. And when we think about translation, I, I think that the, the chapter is couched in uh, the infrastructure that we have within our own organizations to get evidence into practice. So it gives you some very practical uh, strategies, just starting with some examples of translation models. So personally, our teams use a translation model that is around diffusion of innovations in health systems. We work with big health systems. It's a stepwise process because that's the way the model works, starting with assessment of the antecedents, getting the organization ready. It goes through implementation, consequences, the intersection of the health system uh, leadership and the, uh, the change agency. So we have a very specific model we follow and that makes it much easier to plan. So at the beginning of the chapter, you're provided with a number of different models that can work for you. Use one when you think about tra translation, use a framework. The Johns Hopkins nursing model also has a framework uh, for translation. But just to let you know that you can learn from some of these other models and embed them and apply them in the Johns Hopkins model as well. Also, the chapter talks about the importance of embedding this work uh, into the, not only the committee chapter, uh, 
but also uh, thinking about when we translate, it's really quality improvement work that we're doing. And to the extent we can embed this translation into our quality improvement work, and it provides information about the uh, model for improvement. So use the PDSA process uh, to translate and to measure and to create goals, uh, SMART goals. So there's some uh, work in the chapter to help support your uh, initiation of SMART goals, for example. So very practical uh, approaches. The last part of the chapter goes through, uh, and it really, you'll, you'll recognize this as a nursing process. Very often when we translate evidence, we have to figure out, do these recommendations match to our own organization? Do they match to the context to which we're translating? Does it fit? Are they feasible? And then should, do we need to modify the recommendation? Sometimes there's some interchange with uh, our own uh, site or our own um, unit when we're implementing. Uh, there's a next step, you have to develop your action plan. Once, once these are the right recommendations, you understand what can and can't be implemented. And then after you create your action plan, you've got to make sure that there's a budget because very often the implementation is going to take some additional resources, either a, a site coordinator or someone's time uh, to develop uh, an evaluation plan, for example. And then uh, you implement as you intend and then evaluate the outcome. So there are uh, some resources in this chapter to help you with all those parts of the translation process. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. And then we'll bring up uh, the end with the dissemination. So once you all are, once everything's all done, how do you get the word out? So chapter nine, um, Maddie and Judy, um, could you share uh, about the dissemination uh, information that you contained in your chapter? Yeah, so this is um, really easy to talk about what's new because it's all new. Um, we actually pulled the dissemination component out of um, the previous the chapter previously um, and really wanted to stand on its own because we really want people to not only have their work change their own unit or their own setting, but the unit um, units across their own health system or maybe even across the country or the world. And if you can't share your information, then no one else is going to be able to benefit from it. So we go a little bit into sort of the more traditional things like poster presentations, podium presentations at conferences, some kind of good things to know. So much of that is sort of trial and error and you learn as you go. And so we were trying to maybe share some of our own mistakes so that other people do not have to make the same ones. Um, and then one of the things I'm most uh, excited about is we it did include as an appendix to the chapter, a um, template. So if you want to write up your EVP project, sometimes it doesn't fit in your in those sort of traditional headers that you would think of when you're writing up a scientific manuscript. So we kind of helped put all of the pieces that you would have completed in your EBP project into a template with the associated appendix. And so it makes it really easy to put out a manuscript with those prompts, especially for the newer writers. Um, we actually, as far as I know, we now have had, um, we've had two published manuscripts and a third underway um, that have used this template and we've gotten really great feedback from the people who have used it. Um, so I'm really excited about that edition as well. That's great. That's very helpful. Um, chapter 10, I have to say, is my favorite chapter. Uh, this is the chapter on exemplars. I just love reading about projects that have been done in the past and their successes, their obstacles. So um, Kim, how about you share about your exemplar chapter, chapter 10? Okay, uh, the exemplar chapter is one of my favorites as well because we get to learn um, about real world projects. So it's not just us kind of making up examples or us talking about projects we've done. These are actual projects that nurses and other healthcare professionals have done in their organizations. Um, Every, every time we're up for revision, I put a call out to um, my network and ask for any exemplars that they would like to submit for the chapter. And I was very excited. We got a lot of submissions this go round, And not all of them were clinical questions, which I think is a really good, um, a really good uh, example that you don't have to use EVP just to answer clinical questions. You can use it for other things as well. We had one exemplar that was about using gamification in nursing education. We had another one that was about building an EBP culture. So it's not just the clinical questions. You can use EBP for anything to answer any questions that you might have. 
Um, I'm hoping that once our, camp our campaign uh, goes into full swing and we have lots of other disciplines using our model that we'll have some more exemplars that represent other disciplines. I know that there are some um, clerical folks in the hospitals that are using our model. So I've tapped into them for the next edition as well as some physical therapists and um, occupational therapists and social workers. So we're hoping to broaden the exemplar uh, section even more with the next edition. Great, and pastoral counseling. Yes, that's what I meant by clerical. It's not oh, like okay. secretary, but I meant okay. pastoral, pastoral okay. counseling. Yeah, I was impressed with that. Um, we'll keep on going because you're chapter 11 also. So lessons learned from using the Johns Hopkins EBP tools. Well, so chapter 11 is probably my favorite because I was, and helping with all the other editions of the book, I was always pushing to have some kind of chapter that helped show people how to complete the tools. So we provide the, the theory and the background in the chapters, and then we had our appendices, but we didn't really show people what it would look like if these tools were completed or giving them helpful hints. So that's where this chapter comes in. And we I've taken a um, an EBP, an actual EBP project that was conducted at Johns Hopkins Hospital and walked through the tools using that project and showed how you would complete the tools and provided some helpful hints along the way, just helping you figure out what goes in this slot, how do I fill this out, and what would this look like when we're finished. So hopefully our users will find it helpful. Great, I'm sure they will. I know I will. Um, well, that's great. That's a, that's a good synopsis of all the different chapters. And we did have a couple questions roll in. Um, and we are running perfectly for time, I must say. So the first question uh, to Robin, um, you were sharing about the different translation models and um, someone was asking about the, the name of the diffusion model again, if you could just clarify what that was. Yes, uh, it's the Green Hall 2004. In fact, I'm going to respond back to you with the reference. It's uh, the title is Diffusion of Innovations in Service Organizations, Systematic Review and Recommendations. It's one of the best meta narrative I've seen. They pulled all the evidence related to translation in our in our context or to uh, implementation or to diffusion, they called it. And they created a model and it's incredibly simple to use both for uh, evidence-based practice translation and for research. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it in your response. So Holly, it's under your response and I'll put it in the chat. Too. Great. I'm sure others will be interested also. Um, Judy, this question is for you. So will you please provide an example of a foreground and a background question and explain the difference? Okay, so um, I always think of background questions as always, um, and we you could pretty much do it for anything, um, that it when it when you are doing a question around what are the best practices um around x y or z so let's just say um for the first thing that pops into my mind because i'm uh looking at um uh quality prevention right now around foley removal so i would as a background question i might say what are the best practices in pediatric patients um around uh a foley catheter uh, discontinuation algorithm, okay? That could be a background question. Now, what may happen is I might have a very limited evidence base for that because I put the restrictor of pediatrics in that. And so I might be able to extrapolate that um, maybe I just need to say, what are the best practices around uh, critical care patients or with patients in order to get a broader umbrella? So that is what I mean by a background question. You're really essentially um, having the evidence tell you what to do where a foreground question may be something that I, this is how I keep it straight in my brain. So let's say I have quality practices already in place in my unit. However, we haven't reached our ultimate goal of having zero qualities in my unit. What I might go back in is I actually might um, do a new PDSI cycle as a part of a quality improvement initiative of a plan, do, study, act. And so I may go back into the evidence and I may ask a specific foreground question based on whatever element of my bundle, of my quality bundle, may not be performing well, right? That I would know for my process measures. So I'm really um, maybe comparing something 
um, maybe getting into the nitty gritty weeds of a specific uh, intervention and trying to refine it. So that's really how I differentiate in my brain and I try to uh, mentor my bedside nurses as well as my entry level DNP students in that practice of the difference between the two. Really for doctoral work, I really want them to look at things very broadly um, with a background question. So I really um, push them in that direction. Um, and then, um, like I said, uh, if we are you know, following something more long-term and we're trying to differentiate and try to improve our process measures with something, I may go back into the evidence after I've done my background work and actually ask a foreground question um, based on um, my original background question, et cetera. So that's kind of how I differentiate it on my brain. Um, I don't know if others have a, a better way to differentiate it in their brain from the um, panels, but that's really um, how I wrap my head around it. That's great. Um, we did have another question related to patient safety. And I know that Michelle, you, uh, you're very active in the Armstrong Institute. So I don't know whether you would be willing to take this or not, but patient safety is a priority in any organization. So how do we apply EBP to improve patient safety goals? Oh, so that is a great question. Very timely as well. And I know uh, Judy spoke to some of this again with the, the CAUTI, um, looking at what are our best practices that are out there around many of these guidelines, but there are also areas uh, that we still have to uh, dig into uh, as well. Um, uh, one of the issues that we've looked at is um, uh, in the emergency department, we looked at uh, particularly workplace violence. Um, so a staff safety issue that has implications for patient safety. Uh, we'll also look at a variety of medication error um, issues, uh, fall prevention as well. Uh, what is the evidence uh, for supporting fall screening in an emergency department? Many, much of which we see uh, currently has been validated in inpatient settings. So how do we how do we take what is out there, um, both in a research? context as well as in the non-research realm um, and put all that together, synthesize that and come up with what is, uh, what's the evidence telling us that we should put into place. Um, hope that's helpful. Not sure if others have uh, recommendations they'd like to provide. That's great. I think that's great. That's very helpful. And I think that's all the questions that we had. And like I said, time-wise we are, we are spot on. I can't believe how perfectly this all worked out. So if there aren't any more questions, I just want to thank you all uh, for joining this official launch. Now the book is officially launched of the fourth edition of the Johns Hopkins Evidence-Based Practice for Nurses and Healthcare Professionals book. So thank you to all of the authors today um, for taking time out of your schedules to attend the webinar. Thank you for the contributions of everyone that's joining us for your contributions and feedback, which is what actually led to the, rev uh, the revision of the model and tools. I wish you luck on all of your future EBP endeavors and don't forget, you will be getting a special email that includes links to the 2022 tools, also to a, the website where you can purchase um, the STTI book if you're interested, and also to a, um, a very quick, video that Kim and I created uh, comparing the old tools to the revised tools and how they differ. And also the lucky prize of the fourth edition book that will be raffled off to one of our participants today. So um, I guess we will wrap this up and thank you all for joining us. Special thanks to the panelists and um, carry on with your EVP. Thank you guys. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye everyone. Goodbye.